Warning. You've reached on the box with great comfort and are now in a biblical truth zone. Place all questions about theology, current events, and evangelism on the box where they'll be weighed against the truth of God's Word. Ready your hearts and minds. You're about to be inspired and equipped to fulfill the Great Commission. Programming to engage in five, four, three, two, one. All right, welcome to On the Box. My name is Mark Spence. I'll be your host today, alongside of Pastor Dave Doyle. Hey, thanks, Now, Mark. I'm calling him pastor for a reason, because you are one of my pastors. Absolutely. And I'm excited to be here. I've been looking for this opportunity, and one of the things that Dave oversees is discipleship, and it's not just something you've exactly. been kind of thrown in to do. You actually have quite a bit of experience in the subject. Before we get into that, yes, we have an audience that shares their faith. Mm. Here's some people that go door True. to door. Yes. They get up on soapboxes. On the box. They hand out gospel tracts. Absolutely. And this is where we get a little weak. Mm. We begin to shy away and we mm. go, All right, well, guess what? I'm not much of a uh, discipler. Yes. You know, I have a hard time maybe getting deep inside of a conversation. This is where you're going to put us and set us all straight. Absolutely. Today, you're going to have all the answers you could possibly want. All the want. answers, every answer you could possibly think of That's right it. here. Right here. Well, you've been a pastor for a very long time, 28 years. 28 years. Yeah. And you've been making disciples, though, for longer than that. That's right. 35 years, 35 I, years. I believe. Yes. You went to Dallas Theological Seminary. I did. And uh, you have a whole list of, I guess, a resume I can throw out, but... We're not going to get into all those things at this point. I'm going to allow you to talk and tell us why discipleship is all important, because that's Very what good. today's show is all about. Dave Doyle and discipleship, the three Ds. Dave Doyle, discipleship. discipleship. That, awesome. <laughs> that is it. All right, so tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah. Who are you? What do you do? Why are you here? Very good. Hey, Mark, thanks a lot. Uh, uh, basically, uh, start with my family life. Uh, I am married. My wife, Carla, and I have been married for 28 years. We have two great sons, Paul and Keegan, who are a delight to us. Uh, I have been in ministry for about 28 years. Like, like you said, I was saved at 18 years old, went to Bible college, went to seminary, have served as a pastor largely, and also as a professor of theology uh, during those years. But it's really what happened uh, to me at 18 years old that has marked my life. Hmm. Uh, it's made the difference in terms of discipleship. And when I was 18 years old, uh, a man named Dave Wenzel led me to Christ. And he did something at that point that marked my life forever. He took 18 months and spent Monday to Friday, every week, 6 a.m. with me. Wow. And we would spend an hour in prayer. And then if he had time, he would take a second hour. And in that hour, he would train me in three things. Uh, he trained me in discipleship, he trained me in devotion, and he trained me in doctrine. He, he set the foundation of my Christian life. I'm taking notes now. Th this is going to be good. <laughs> this is going to be good. But he, but he set the basic tone of that in three things. He, he gave the foundational principles of doctrine, uh, told me what the Bible said, what the theological points of, of Christian faith was. And then he set a framework of devotion, which is loving God and loving your neighbor, the great, the great commandment. Yeah. And, and trained me on loving God with my heart, soul, mind, strength, and my neighbor as myself. And then discipleship, the very idea that we're talking about today, which is the Great Commission in Matthew 28. He showed me, uh, you know, by, by virtue of spending all this time with me, and then trained me and kind of sent me out. So what and exactly so, is discipleship? I mean, lay a foundation for us it's a good question. at the beginning. Yeah, uh, I, like to, I do a talk on discipleship that I call demystifying discipleship because it has the same effect as evangelism does. When you do all your training on evangelism here at Living Waters, you're often demystifying for people this idea, I couldn't do it. Right. Uh, I, I don't know the words. What if they ask me a question yeah, I don't know? It's right. like that famous 10 objections to evangelism yeah. you guys do. And discipleship has the same kind of thing. It's, it's common objections to discipleship uh, would include, I'm not mature enough. Hmm. Uh, I couldn't possibly do that. That's only for gurus or for the elite. And so let me de demystify it by saying this. Discipleship is spiritual parenting. That's what discipleship is. Uh, it is taking a person from babyhood through to spiritual maturity where they feed themselves, and then they can reproduce in the lives of others that which they've learned. And so, uh, Mark, you've said this a bunch of times. You've said, we don't want to just make converts. Uh, we want to make disciples. Right. And so in light of that, that's kind of the idea of what discipleship is. It's spiritual parenting. It's taking a person and saying, you're not just a convert or a baby, uh, but we want to train you to be a mature adult. And so 
Discipleship is essentially taking a person from stage one all the way through as far as you can to spiritual maturity. So g- give us the big picture overall. Okay. I mean, you started to touch upon it. Give me a bigger yeah, yeah. picture of discipleship. Okay, good. Uh, in the New Testament, uh, we're often told that uh, there's a parallel between spiritual growth and physical growth. Uh, sometimes you get this whole idea of being a child, uh, then you're sort of an adolescent, and then you're mature. And in First John, it talks about... Uh, f- children, I talk to you, and it used the Greek word for babies. Mm. And then it says, children, I also work for you, or say to you, and it looks like in English the same thing, yeah. but it's the next word up, which is for child. Then he says to young men, which is our equivalent of... There's a, a progression here. A progression, yeah. And then he says to the fathers, I say this. And uh, also it's said as in scripture, uh, to uh, the babies, uh, milk is appropriate for them. And at times Paul has to say, I couldn't address you like a mature person. Right, right. So there's a motif in the New Testament in which discipleship follows a pattern of physical parenting. Uh, You take a person from their babyhood through the various stages up through maturity. And so discipleship has usually three stages. It has follow-up, which is infant care. Right. Now it's neonatal care. So when you bring a baby home, you've got your follow-up. Then there's the building stage where you're building blocks of maturity and giving them the essentials of Christian living. And then the third stage typically is the training and sending stage. And uh, in a few minutes, if we get a chance, I'd like to talk about how d- Jesus did that All right, a- right. as a model for us as well. Yeah, oh boy, that's, that's exciting. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, what do you think of the process you know, between the Great Commission and the great commandment. Mm. Have you ever given that much thought? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That, that's a stickler for some because you have sort of great commandment ministries and you have great commission ministries. Right. And sometimes they're knocking heads. You know, evangelism is more important than discipleship. So they can be married important. together, you think? Absolutely. How, Absolutely. how does that happen? What does it look like? I don't know. Um, <laughs> 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 no, uh, think of it this way. Uh, let's go to Matthew 28 and, and think about it this way. Uh, Matthew 28 gives us three basic things. Uh, Go into all the world and make disciples and baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. And then train them or teach them to observe or to do all that I've commanded you. Basically, you have a a, a basic pattern there that you would expect to see in discipleship. Uh, You are to make disciples. Go implies going out in ministry. Make disciples is actually make converts. Mm. But it's the idea of evangelizing. Go and make disciples if you will. You can't make, but God makes people to be disciples or converts. Then what do you do with them? You baptize them, and that identifies them with the local church, identifies them with their stand for Christ. And then the most important part of this in discipleship is then train them to do or observe all that I have commanded you. It doesn't say teach them to know, but it's teach them to do. And so discipleship formally that we talk about, being discipled, Uh, is the idea of the third part, and that is uh, being trained to do all that Christ commanded. But the first part, evangelism, the great, uh, as we talk about the Great Commission, is to go and make disciples. What is the core curriculum of those? That's the Great Commandment. What are we trying to teach them to observe? The Great Commandment is the greatest teachings that we can possibly teach somebody. So when okay. Christ says, go and make disciples, teach them to observe all that I've commanded you, He's really saying, teach them to do the great commandment then, is to love God and love your neighbor. It right. says there's no greater, higher moral good than the great commandment, okay. is to love God. And so the best curriculum for discipleship at the end of Matthew 28, 19, 20 is the great commandment. And so they're wed together as the purpose of life is a great commandment, uh, but the mission is to go out and make disciples. How do those wed together? The greatest moral good is to love God. And if I love God and that's my greatest good, then it follows that it'd be my neighbor's best interest to also love God and to be loved by him. And so I love my neighbor best by fulfilling the great commission because I'm fulfilling the great right. commandment. So well, there's I, a wedding together of those two so things. So I, I was part of a, a movement at one time. And once the person supposedly came, came to the Lord, and I'm not sure if they came to the Lord, if they yeah. didn't, I had to do intense follow-up. I had to check up on them. Are you reading the Bible? Are you in prayer? Are you in fellowship? Yes. And it seemed to me that I was propping up an individual, trying to get them to be part of a club. Yes. That there was really no transition or change or transformation of the heart. Yes. So it helped me out to understand what follow-up has. What role does follow-up have in talking to an individual? That's good. Um, You know, unlike the parallel with babies that we bring home, uh, physically at home, 
where we're going to work with them no matter what. <laughs> you know, three days in, you don't go, well, hey, they don't like eating, so, right. you know, we'll send them back. Right. Uh, but discipleship requires both. It requires the disciple maker to want to do it, and it requires the willingness of the disciple to be discipled. Uh, it requires the other person to desire growth. So the first thing you would check up on is the genuineness of their conversion. I mean, as you're saying. Why did you become a Christian? Yeah, wh- why did you become a Christian? Uh, when, when this happened to you, what was it that you believed? Uh, you're looking for true conversion, as you often talk about, is that we don't want to leave people with a false uh, faith. And so that first follow-up stage usually has five assurances that you usually talk about. Uh, usually assurance of my salvation. Do I know the gospel? Have I trusted in Christ really? Or have I gotten a new religion? Mm-hmm. And then uh, my assurance of answered prayer, my assurance of of God's work in my life, assurance of forgiveness. That first stage in that sort of baby stage is, is making sure that they really have understood the gospel and trusted it and have an assurance of that before you move on to anything else. Because then, I've done it too. You're discipling somebody, but they're not really being discipled. Right. And so, you know the classic marks, um, faithful, available, teachable. Hmm. Uh, if they're not faithful, they won't show up. They're not available. Hey, I'm busy. Or they're not teachable when they're there. They're really not being discipled. They're, they're just coming with a notebook, you know, want to get it filled in for you. So, so. so should I not share my faith with someone unless I know I can disciple them? <laughs> That's right, Mark. Because <laughs> I talk to people that are out there and they're saying, hey, look, we are to go in all the world and we are to make disciples, not converts. Mm. And people are heavy on this. No. We get criticized for this. Okay. I don't think that's what Matthew 28 is saying. Because they're, they're, they're talking about, they're not distinguishing terms. Let's see if we can do that. Okay. There's a difference, in my estimation, between disciple, discipleship, and discipling. Right. Okay. Okay. All right. A disciple is a convert. There, there's no distinction in the New Testament. You don't become a disciple of Jesus uh, after you become a Christian. By signing on and accepting Christ as your Lord and Savior, you've signed on to discipleship. Right, okay. You have become a disciple. Let's define disciple, right? A disciple is a mathetes, the Greek word, and it simply means follower of Jesus Christ. But it also means apprentice. The New Testament disciple is not someone who is a learner in the book learning sense. They're not going to college and uh, following a professor who they write down the notes for. But the idea of disciple in the New Testament, mathetes, in that culture meant an adherent to the teachings of someone. Someone is emulating and, and borrowing from that master and learning what they were doing. And it means to try to live in light of what they're doing. And the highest compliment you could pay someone was if you were their disciple was to make disciples like them. So Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, Greeks had mathetases. John the Baptist had mathetases, the New Testament says. And so to be a follower of somebody in that culture meant not a book learner, but it meant to be an adherent to what they said and believer in what they said, and subsequently to try to do what they do and to follow their example. So if we start with the word disciple, in our estimation, there's no distinction between Christian and disciple. However, there is a distinction between being a good disciple and a bad disciple, right? Right, Definitely. And that's where I think the confusion comes in, is discipleship is how far you've been a disciple and how long. Like you and I can have relations here, but we have a relationship as it builds. Certainly. A disciple can be a follower of Christ, but uh, discipleship is how long you've gone in that direction. And let me do one more word. Discipling is what people do to a disciple that's the process that right. someone comes alongside of a disciple to help in their life of discipleship, of following Christ. And so, back to that question, um, in Matthew 28, 19 and 20, it is saying, go into all the world and cause people to become followers of Jesus Christ. It's not go into all the world and set up a program of discipleship. They're applying too much in that word disciple. Gotcha. To make disciples. They're implying a, a navigators or the crusade, and, and they're... In, all of that's there as a program. I would call that a process of discipling someone. But Jesus is talking about go and make the person a follower of Jesus Christ, which implies evangelism. It implies conversion, at which case you are a disciple, and a true disciple then would be baptized and follow Christ. So Jesus obviously had 12 disciples. Yep. How did he make disciples? How did he go about doing it? And is that certainly Mm. a model that we are to follow? I think so. Um, 
You know, a lot of good work has been done on that, Mark. Uh, some good books, some good materials. In the 1800s, a fellow named A.B. Bruce wrote a book called The Training of the Twelve. And in it, he, he takes uh, the life of Christ and, and does a masterful job of watching Jesus' life and saying, is there a strategic plan to this discipleship thing? Huh. Or was it merely organic? Yeah. Was it only relational or did it have a pattern? And that book then was picked up in the, in the 1900s and written by Robert Coleman called The Master Plan of Evangelism, where what he does in that book, he, he kind of synthesizes all that Bruce did and shows you the pattern that Jesus followed. So I'd like to suggest there are three, three stages. All right. Okay. Uh, in the Gospels, I believe Jesus did three things. First, he had a come and, and see stage where he simply tells people, come and see what I'm doing, and it's an evangelism stage. Then he has a come and follow me stage where he calls men to discipleship proper. Come to me and now be trained by me. And then there's a third stage he followed through, which is come and be with me. The first four or five months of Christ's life in the Gospels, uh, in his public ministry, he's only inviting people to evangelism. The woman at the well, John 3.16, uh, Peter's conversion, all of that takes place in the first five months of his public ministry. And then he takes them to the wedding at Cain of Galilee, where sort of the marker, and the woman at the well, where he then says, okay, guys, uh, there's a bigger picture than now you guys are saved. Yeah. And at that point, it marks a, a second stage where he says, come and follow me, and they stopped being itinerants, and they joined him. And for about 10 or 11 months, he said, come and I'll make you fishers of men. And there's about 10 or 11 months where he takes them on tour and he shows them his glory. And that's sort of the discipleship of he answers their questions and, and how do I pray and all those things. But then at a distinct point, you know, where he starts to do the parables and he starts kind of excluding the crowd, not because he doesn't intend to reach them, but because he turns to his leadership. That third stage is he invites those 12 men at that point to be with him. And he has marked groups. He has 5,000 he's ministering to about 120 who end up in the upper room. And then he has the, the 70 or so, two by two, he sent out. And then he has the 12. And at that point, he turned the last 20 months of his ministry to the training of the 12. In fact, the three, James, Peter, and John, right. who he trained for specific ministries and trained them to take the next step as the leaders of a worldwide discipleship movement. And do you think that's in part why Jesus often called the disciples away from the other people, where you see hmm. major events, and there's only a couple there. You think of the raising right. of Jairus' daughter. Absolutely. You know, only the elite Absolutely. were able to uh, examine That's that. Exactly. Uh, the Mount of Transfiguration takes Peter, James, and John. He yep. takes them in the upper, and he's training them for specific things, and he'll often say to Peter, hey, when, uh, when you've recovered yourself, help your brothers, yeah. you know, and, and that type of thing. So he was training them for specific ministry purpose as the leaders of the next movement. Okay, well, let's talk about cost for a second. This okay. isn't usually part of an evangelical message <laughs> that people need to count the cost. We see this perhaps yeah. in a third world country or in the 1040 window. But when we begin to say count the cost, yeah. that is something somebody really had to do yeah. in the first century. Yeah. But not only there, even today, I know that when I became a Christian, uh, I had to get all new friends. Yes. I didn't want to get all new friends, but they didn't want to have anything to do with me. Absolutely. Let's talk about counting the cost. Okay as a disciple, or even becoming a Christian. Very good. No, you're absolutely right, Mark. Uh, uh, Diedrich Bonhoeffer's famous book, The Cost of Discipleship, has a good quote in it uh, where he tells us, Christianity without discipleship is Christianity without Christ. Ooh. And so, he, wow, <laughs> zowie. <laughs> and so, in other words, there is no Christianity without discipleship. Uh, I, I, there is no following Jesus without following Jesus. And Jesus said, if you want to come after me, You'll need to deny yourselves, take up your cross, and die daily and come after me. And uh, in fact, the, the sort of things that are the marks of a disciple in the New Testament uh, can le be easily arranged in that way to look at them as the cost of discipleship. Uh, denial of oneself, uh, uh, claiming that Christ is more to me than my family, mm -hmm. my possessions. It's a selling of yourself to his purposes. Um, I have a friend who also had a good quote, and that was the idea that... Uh, the cost of disobedience is always higher than the cost of discipleship. And that there's no cost that Christ is asking us to do in terms of following him that would be higher than ultimate losses. You know, Jim Elliott, he's no fool who gives up what he cannot right. keep to gain what he cannot lose. And so discipleship has a cost, but it doesn't cost you your soul. It does not cost, you know, it's the foolish man who gains the whole world and loses your soul. So the cost is relative, Paul says, you know, I count these things and I look at them, but they're, they're only loss in this world. 
and, and we've gained Christ. So. so we have accountability that begins to flow into this discipleship. Yeah. People don't like to be accountable today. True. I don't want to open up my closet and allow somebody to see where I've been. Yes. Things that I've done. You know, in fact, the Bible says that it's shameful the things that are done in darkness. That's right. That's right. And every idle word a man speaks, he's going to have to give an account thereof. Everything done in darkness, God has seen. The eyes of God move to her. So I just think of this. God knows. Mm. Why do I need to let man know perhaps yeah. my current struggles? Good. Can, Good word. Can I have a relationship with God enough to where, I mean, he knows where I'm at. He knows mm -hmm. the oh, things. Absolutely. What's, the, what's advantageous of me sharing with you if you're going to disciple me these right. things? No, excellent, excellent. Um, you know, that's the side of discipleship that we often forget because discipleship usually has a lone ranger approach. I am a disciple maker yeah. and, and I'm only going to disciple you. But the, lo the local church uh, is really a key uh, in terms of this. There's really three or four major elements in a good discipleship. One is the disciple maker and then the local church yeah. uh, where other Christians are involved in the one and others of Christian faith. And so those are the things you're commanded uh, love one another. Uh, care for one another, exhort one another. Um, and those one another's can't be done by yourself. And so that new disciple has to learn that Christianity is, is a group effort uh, and inclusive of discipleship and accountability to other people. Confess your sins one to another. And those type of one another's needs to be so taught. So how deep and do you go? Would it yeah. be a current struggle? I mean, I have this, or temptations. I have these temptations. Obviously, temptation is not a sin. Otherwise, right. Jesus was tempted to be a Satanist. Right. 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 So we have these temptations that are ongoing in my life, I shouldn't make these temptations known to my accountability partner, to my wife, to That's right. somebody. Um, we got to make a distinction, but also bring together the whole idea of uh, discipleship and biblical counseling work fairly close together. Yeah. Uh, often what you're doing is you're crossing the line back and forth. If you, if you have a newborn Christian who has significant and major baggage of life, then you're going to spend a lot of your time doing what you'd call discipleship counseling, where you're using the scriptures to bring to bear on issues in their life uh, relative to their family or their upbringing or, or, or issues within their soul, that you're often covering issues as you're a, you're a counselor for all that matter. But this counseling is a cul-de-sac. If you take people down the road of counseling is the whole, all of discipleship, you often get people who are in a therapy model. Uh, they just want to be healed from their problems mm -hmm. or they just want to talk about their problems. And you know, you've had people you try to disciple that ultimately uh, you've got to move them on in discipleship closer to the Lord. So biblical counseling takes place, but you're moving them towards the goal of following Christ with all of their heart. And so uh, those things should be shared. Deep issues should be shared um, in, in that relationship as there's trust built between those. So two should people. everybody be discipled and be discipling? At what point is there perhaps the, the baton is passed over and said, you right. know what, I'm done. And now that's just accountability partners, right. friends. Right. Um, discipleship, I think, blends into the English word. We often use mentoring or, okay. or whatever. At a certain point, formally, we usually talk about discipleship being follow-up, that early stage where someone becomes a Christian and then gets built up, and then they get trained and go off on their own. And so typically when people are mature enough in their faith, we're no longer discipling them sort of the way we generally look at it. But there's still discipleship training as you go along. We often would probably call it mentoring or training at different stages of your life where it has individual things. Would you train me to do this or teach me to do this or how to deal with my children or how to deal with my budget, those kind of things. You cover those in the early stages, but at a certain point, a mature Christian needs other guys to come alongside in specific areas, but not to lay the foundation again, typically speaking. Yeah. All right. My schedule's busy. I got a lot of things on my plate. You know, I, I barely have enough time to brush and floss my teeth. <laughs> Is discipling for me? Should I yes. be discipling, going to making disciples? Yes. And that is like the question of evangelism. The same question is, uh, I need to make room for it because it's a command. But I also recognize discipleship is a relational thing. And as such, I can fit it in as part of my relationship. Whether I have somebody over for dinner, or I have somebody uh, that I meet for breakfast, or I meet with them in the course of my life, uh, it, it's something you incorporate into the whole. 
And you have to have a you have it's to kind have of who you are. This is what I do. That's this right. is part of my makeup. That's right. And and Mark, I want to say uh, a lot of people ask, well, what what curriculum do I use? What do I do? Right. You know, do I go out and get this book or whatever? And uh, there are very good curriculums out there, materials you can use. But in essence, I would say this: I started years ago a thing that is transferable concepts and things that I could write on a napkin that I would want to train somebody. And so I have like. 50 to 100 in that range of these transferable concepts. And I'd say to a person, what are the 10 things that you have learned in your Christian life that have made the most difference? Write those down on a piece of paper and then try to teach that to your convert. Uh, you don't have to be, you know, kung fu master. Yep. Uh, you can just train them in the things that have made the most difference in your life. Boy, okay, so somebody catches the vision here. They're saying, all right, I want to make disciples. Yes. I need something a little bit deeper than a 27 and a half minute teaching. Yes. Is there a book out there that you might recommend yes. to someone? Yes, there is. Uh, there's a fellow named Christopher Adsit, and he wrote a book called Personal Disciple Making. And it's a master tome. It's pretty thick, but it takes you through all the priority of discipleship and the, the plan and all of those things. It takes you all the way through what to teach your disciple, all the kind of good stuff. All right, so how can people find more about our church? We have the best Woo! church inside the world. We, we do. Uh, what is our church? Our kindredchurch.org. Kindredchurch.org. You can go to the website there, find out lots. And we also have Know the Truth Radio, which Pastor That's Philip right. DeCourcy is on uh, nationally. You can hear him speak as well. Nice. So know the truth radio. You don't want to miss that. Philip DeCourcy, our senior pastor, lays it down daily, Monday through Friday. You can catch that online if you're not in the area. This is what we want you to do. Here is your call to action this weekend. You got to find a believer, make yourself available, and help them grow. Mm. Tell them, hey, what can I do to pour into you? I want you to be all that God wants you to be. What can I do to be that? And it might be a good fit. It might not be a good fit. Well, until next Monday, God bless you. Have a great week, and uh, go share your faith and be willing to disciple. Mm -hmm. For questions about On the Box with Ray Comfort or to submit questions for future shows, please email onthebox at livingwaters.com. That's onthebox at livingwaters.com. On the Box with Ray Comfort is an outreach of Living Waters. For more resources to inspire and equip you to fulfill the Great Commission, check out livingwaters.com or call toll-free 1-800-437-1893. Now go and preach the gospel.